setting. And I thought the elephants are a good way to start this conference because they're probably the biggest animals. I think we'll start with elephants and then we'll get to maybe flies and sea elegans. Um, for them, their movement is, we're studying the movement of their trunk, which is in this picture here, weighs 100 kilograms, but they can use their trunk to pick up very fragile items. Like that's actually a tortilla chip. We eat them in the United States. They fracture very easily, but the elephant can pick it up without breaking it. And I'll show you how. Um, the elephant can also pick up other items of various numbers and sizes. Um, they're very, very hungry. The elephants, they, they eat 200 kilograms per day, so they have to basically pick up and eat 100 grams every minute, which means about two bananas every single minute. They've got to, so they often pick up many items at once. Um, there's a recent paper talking about how elephants view the world, and um, it's not, people think it's, um, that it's not very much through vision. They're, they're nearsighted. So they, there's a recent PNAS paper by Josh Plotnick showing that they can actually determine the number of food items by smell. So they can actually put their nose and determine which to eat by how strongly it smells. And they can count the number of seeds roughly by smell. Um, so in the middle of the presentation, I'll show you um, a model and some experiments on animal sniffing rates and why animals sniff, why we don't take long inhales, and why we, you know, at least if you're an animal, go inhale and exhale. In the last part of the talk, um, uh, I thought we'd have a little fun, even though it's not part of the official title. Um, we'll talk about, um, does anyone know what that animal is? Do we have anyone from Australia? Wombats, wow, yeah, wombats, good. Um, and that's their feces, so they make cubic feces. Um, and we actually, we're working with an Australian scientist. We have wombat intestines and feces in our lab, and we have some ideas for why a soft intestine can make edges and squares. So hopefully we'll have time to get to that before coffee break, where we're going to have brownies or, or something that's a, some other chocolate, chocolate item. Um, so this, a lot of this work is done by my uh, graduate students and um, postdocs. Um, oh, and um, this is done over the last two years at Atlanta Zoo. We have a zookeeper that basically keeps the students safe because an elephant at any time can really grab somebody and really just break their neck. Um, I'll show some dissected elephant trunks that's done by Joy Reidenberg. Um, oops, Joy Reidenberg, who's on this show, Dissecting Nature's Giants. Uh, I met her on Twitter, um, and she found the only elephant trunk in the United States that was able for us to dissect. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'll talk a little about um, this device we built that mimics the sniffing rates of animals. Um, and we use it to basically get third place in this competition to distinguish different types of cheese. So IEEE has a competition every year to basically make a machine olfaction device. And um, this is the contest. Those are the cubes of cheese that are being put into the device. And that's the judges eating the cheese uh, after the contest is over. So it's a very sustainable um, competition. So everything is eaten afterward. And these are, this is my collaborator, Scott Carver, uh, in Australia, and my students, Miles and Fisher, who worked on wombats. Um, I turn on the sound here, let's see. So that is about 50 chunks of rutabaga, um, a potato-like um, um, vegetable. And um, the elephant kind of, this is a force platform. They see the food and they reach out. And um, they're also very good house cleaners. They make sure they don't leave anything um, in the wake. So they make sure to grab each part. Um, this is, this is atypical of what they'll do, but this is an example of them using the entire trunk as an implement. To do this, they have to know exactly how much frictional force to squeeze um, in order to keep it jammed together and acting like a, a granular solid. Um, that's a line of mucus. They leave this sort of mucus. Uh, they have runny noses all the time. I don't understand why that is, but they always they would leave that behind. So to do that task, they, elephants do a lot of sensation, but right now no one really knows how elephants sense their environments. The skin of their trunk is still thicker than the heel of your foot. Um, but the trunk, people don't know this, it's covered in hairs. Um, uh, that's, the trunk is about a meter and a half long, and most of the hairs are um, around 10 centimeters long. So those are the hairs on the base uh, in the trunk. They're very thick and wiry. So they have about the same length as um, whiskers, um, cats and sea lions and these other animals that sense the world through deformation of these whiskers. 
Um, so we think that they basically have a sense a tactile function. Um, the whiskers on the trunk are much higher density and they're much shorter. Um, and we think those are really specialized in to be able to measure the, where these objects are in space and to perform the tasks that I'm going to show you. Um, let's turn off the sound for now. And this and it. So these are some dissections we've done with the elephant of two regions at uh, the same location. Simply one is dorsal, that means the top of the trunk, and one's ventral on the bottom. Um, so you can see this one is, is basically has these, in order for the trunk to extend to reach these objects, it can extend 20% of its length. And to do that, it has this sort of telescoping skin that allows it to um, sort of reach without having high strain to the skin. Um, the ventral surface is a lot, um, has a lot more wrinkles that are, that are similar to our wrinkles. I mean, not like these folds, but be these wrinkles. And it's interesting that the dorsal and ventral surfaces are very, are very um, different. Um, this is one of the hairs that I just showed you. Um, it's actuated, so what we're doing is it has um, about a centimeter where it's, it can be actuated by muscles. And these hairs are actually embedded inside the folds. So as the trunk opens up, it can extend and sort of release more hairs so it can sort of sense its environment. Um, we have not actually seen the elephant do this um, with the hairs yet, but um, it seems like they're actuated, so it, it is a possibility. So the first kind of way I, the elephants uh, pick up objects, um, I want to show you is this, this video here. Um, oops. So if you listen carefully, that's the sound you hear when you go to a Chinese noodle restaurant. Maybe not Italian noodle. I think Italians maybe think that's probably kind of gross. Um, but uh, that's the sound of the elephant generating what we calculate is around like um, almost 70 miles per hour of airflow to pick up these objects and suck it, suck it into the trunk. Um, they don't always do that kind of, that kind of motion. Um, for example, if the objects are uh, fewer, um, then, then instead of uh, providing large energy to provide suction, they'll basically just push them together um, and pick them up individually, as you, as you would expect. So we can create this regime diagram for when they actually turn on the suction power. When the objects are many in number and small in size, um, the elements have know that basically this, the pressure force they can generate can actually pick them up. And so they'll actually uh, turn on the suction power for a few seconds. Um, when the objects are large enough, they, they know that basically these things are too heavy to suck up, and they basically will just pick them up individually. Um, here's an example of, of how organized they are when they're, when they're picking up objects. Um, they really try to go in vertical columns um, to sort of get as many objects as they can into this tip of this trunk before they pick it up. Um, so somehow they have this sort of coordinate system of basically going vertically and horizontally away from their body. This idea of using suction um, was originally observed by Darwin, um, except um, he and a few and these Japanese investigators um, later showed that um, they don't use uh, just suction, but they can actually use uh, blowing. So what this elephant is doing is it's, um, here, it's trying to collect these leaves that are just slightly out of reach. So it blows against the ground in order to push these leaves into a pile. So the elephants have this idea of reflection, of using the fluid as sort of an arm to reflect and to grab these objects. So that's trying to grab this tiny, maybe 10 calorie piece of twig, and it's almost going to fall on its face because it's on three legs, and it blows against the wall in order to do this. Um, remember, they've got to eat 100 grams every minute. So for them, that kind of behavior is kind of worthwhile. So this is actually a high speed video of ele elephants grabbing this tortilla chip. As I said, the elephants are kind of nearsighted, so they never grab the food directly. This one always misses it, just hits the force platform slightly to the left. And then... When you say nearsighted, how far? Um, it's not really well known, but um, they... they uh, sorry? Just both of them. Like, what's their vision compared to human vision? 
um, they, they tend to feel, to feel around for things. I think they can see things far, far away, but for the food items, they're really using touch and olfaction. Um, I mean, in terms of like categorizing like human vision, I don't think those uh, tests have those tests haven't really been done. Um, but that's a that's a good idea to try to try to do. So let's let's play this again. <coughs> so they can at least see where the forest platform is, and you can see it's sort of feeling around looking for this um, small bump that's going to be this tortilla chip. Um, this is not the first time it's eaten this, but it's, it's one of the first. Um, and um, it feels this bump and it moves it around. Okay? It can actually push it around until it gets to the right position. And what it's looking for is to provide most of the surface area on top of the item and then turn on the suction so it can pick it up. So using suction is really the only way it can pick up this object because this is a millimeter thick. And it really can't you know, get the lip of its trunk underneath. Um, and this is what I thought would happen. Um, if, I, if we gave them this task. This is what happened if we cover the top of this lid uh, and they break this chip into pieces, they actually get kind of angry, um, but they go back and make sure to get the remaining pieces. Um, so this is something they want to avoid doing, breaking it. They really want to be gentle in order, in order to pick it up. So when we did this experiment, the first thing I did was try to go home and see if I could pick up items with my nose. Um, because I thought it's a really good way to save time. So I went home and I tried to pick up a grape and a cherry, and I was unsuccessful. And then, and then I went to get tortilla chips. And then, so I practiced it. Oops, I practiced a couple of times. Um, and the thing is, the key is, if you want to pick up something by suction, you have to be very close. And the reason for that is because when you provide this pressure force, you're bringing air velocity from your nostrils. But if you look at larger and larger hemispheres, Away from, away from your nose, the flow rates through those larger and larger hemispheres decreases very rapidly. So you have to be very close in order to your airflow to provide the suction pressure to pick up these objects. So from here, I won't be able to do it. Oops. Ah. But if I get close enough, then I can actually pick it up. And I think that's what the elephant's doing. They're getting close enough they can actually apply their su suction pressure. Now, the elephant has two things that we do not have. One, its lungs are 30 times bigger than ours. So it can apply that large velocity for three or four seconds, enough to grope around and find the object. Um, and the other thing is that the elephant's nostrils are, are three times wider than ours. Um, and that allows them to use the same pressure force to generate a much higher flow rate. Um, so we can, you can calculate basically um, uh, using arguments of you know what the pressure the lungs are, are applying, you know the radius of the nostrils, and you look at basically a distance uh, away, you can calculate the radius that you can be away from the tip of the trunk that you can actually generate a force to pick up a tortilla chip of a low amount of weight. And so now we had to the task of actually measuring the elephant's pressure force, which hadn't been done before. And so we did this test to measure the pressure it takes to pick up water. Um, so that's actually, these experiments are done very far away, but this is actually a very large amount of water. It, it drinks about six liters in two seconds. Uh, so six liters is like, you know, about this big. Um, and that's about the rate of 15 shower heads. So 15 showers running uh, in reverse. Um, and this little experiment on the side here, you can see, um, you can see that's, well, let's turn this off for a second. Um, this is basically this idea of, I mentioned that if you're very far away um, from the tip of the trunk, you won't have a very high velocity. So these are uh, chia seeds. Everything you give elephants has to be edible. So we basically, and you can see close to the trunk, the velocities are very high and very, very far away, it's low. And that's why I could only pick up the food when my nose was within a centimeter. So, the elephant trunk has about six liters of capacity. That's how much it can hold um, before the food is ejected into the mouth. And um, it can augment that, we think, by, by basically um, expanding its nostrils. So this is, um, this is a picture of a cross-section, not of that same elephant. This is an elephant that died a long time ago. Um, where you can, you can see there's these radial muscles going outward, uh, longitudinal muscles that allow this thing to stretch 
uh, and muscles that are basically allowed to twist as well. Um, and we think the radial muscles are responsible for expanding these nostrils. We think um, from ultrasound, we think it can expand up to 12 or 16%, which can increase uh, the volume that this thing can hold. So uh, given the elephant's pressure of, uh, we measured it to be about 10 kilopascals, um, you can estimate that they're basically siphoning air at around 70 meters per second or 100, around 160 miles an hour. That's about half as high as the high-speed train in France and uh, a bit faster than a human sneeze because it's sustained over a longer period of time. And I mentioned before that um, they can do it, they can pick up objects because their lungs are so big and their nostrils are much wider, which allows them a bigger, basically allows them to be farther away from the objects before they actually pick them up. So they don't always pick up tortilla chips. Um, sometimes they'll pick up small grains, cereals, and things like that. And then they have to be, again, they want to do as few trips as possible. So what they do is um, use the ability of these materials to jam. So if you were to uh, you know, make a pizza or something with flour on the table and you had to pick up flour, you would do the same thing. You would squeeze the flour together in order to pick it up. And um, they're amazingly clean about it. I mean, that's, that's a lot of um, flour. That was, was 40,000 grains of um, cereal dust. And they do something comparable when there's basically um, different numbers of particles. They'll jam them together. These are the force um, measurements, uh, the normal forces on this plate. And from this, we learned that the minimum force they can really apply is about 10, 10 newtons. So when they're touching the plate, that's sort of the most gentle, gentle they can be. And that's pretty much the breaking force of the tortilla chip. Uh, 10 newtons or one kilogram of weight is how much when those tortilla chips will break. Um, we also noticed that basically when the food items were smaller, they applied much higher forces, um, up to 30, 30 newtons. Um, and the reason for that is because of the way these materials behave when they're jamming. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. But um, one thing we notice is, is that the trunks will have different shapes when they're picking up different numbers of materials. For example, uh, when the objects are very few, the trunk will be straight, as you kind of expect. But when there's 40,000 of these very small uh, objects, what they'll do is they'll generate a kink, and that's almost uh, you know, 10 centimeters tall. So uh, if you measure the force on this platform, um, this provides about 20, the weight of this part here provides about 20% of this force. So what we think that they're doing is they're it's relaxing part of the trunk so they can use self-weight, sort of part of the weight of the trunk to apply forces in order to jam these materials. And this idea of generating these, um, you know, these kinks is not new. Um, octopuses, which were studied um, by Benny Hockner in Israel, um, also generate kinks. And this is a common way to basically pick up objects when you have many, many degrees of freedom. Um, here, when the object, uh, for an octopus, they have tentacles along the entire arm because they can't tell where they're gonna touch it. They can basically stick to the object anywhere along here. Uh, that sends a neurological signal to the head, another signal is sent forward. And right in the middle, you basically perform this elbow, this kink, and that allows it, the octopus to bring it, bring it to its mouth. Um, so perhaps something similar is happening with the elephants. Now, the reason they have to generate a, a kink of a larger uh, vertical distance um, for the smaller objects has to do with the fact that each of these small objects has a small probability of failing. So that idea is kind of demonstrated here. Um, um, if you basically are trying to hold a series of granular materials, they each have a small probability of failing, and you've got to squeeze um, in order to prevent them from failing. But as you increase the number of objects, um, the, force, um, the force goes up that you need to, um, goes up with basically the, the exponent of the number of these objects. So basically, once you have five or eight, you really have to squeeze very, very hard in order to pick, pick them up. So that's basically what the elephant's doing. It's squeezing in order to prevent them from picking up, and I think it has a shear force sensor to detect when they're slipping. Because I don't think they can actually calculate um, the amount of force they need. They just figure out when it's slipping and then it provide just that amount of force. So these are some experiments of um, 
elephants weightlifting. Um, that is actually 20 kilograms. It doesn't look like it's very heavy. Um, uh, and we give them a reward every time they lift, lift the weight. Um, they actually have broken this weightlifting setup. We taught them to lift weights, but we never taught them to put them down gently. Um, so uh, this apparatus is, is broken. <laughs> um, this is 95, uh, about 40 kilograms, 40 kilogram weight. Um, So uh, one thing we observe from this is that they have a couple principles to lift heavier weights. One is that as they lift heavier weights, their trunk gets more vertical. So the section that interacts with the beam, that's the heaviest weight here, becomes more vertical. And so they can basically um, act as a better actuator. Um, and that's partly done automatically because the trunk is, you know, an you can imagine it as an elastic cantilever. And it basically bends more sharply with, with heavier weights. And so they basically, um, uh, they basically make it more vertical as the weights get heavier. And the amount of curvature is, as you would expect for, um, people have actually tried to estimate the material properties of the elephant trunk. It's about one uh, megapascal. And the amount of curvature that you see is um, consistent with those uh, previous measurements. The other thing the elephant trunk does is that it increases its surface area of grip. So um, it can go from basically having a, a lip contact um, for very light weights to wrapping the entire trunk around uh, to almost a cycle and a little bit more in order to increase the contact area. The top contact area really doesn't help it lift, um, but I think maybe it helps the stability. This weight really does go vertically up and down, uh, but they naturally kind of do this in order to pick up these heavier weights and reduce the stress that they have on the trunk. So even though the weights get heavier because they have higher contact, this, the contact stresses here don't really change very much. So um, now I want to talk a little bit about how um, these animals sniff and uh, how we built this device to win the sniffing competition. Um, this device is named Gromit for um, this cartoon where um, Gromit and his friend go to the zoo uh, sorry, go to the moon in order to see if it's made out of cheese. Um, uh, this is the device, and um, it was built in about two or three weeks uh, by a really great engineering grad student. So we wanted to make it uh, basically give behavior that's comparable to a dog. So we wanted the airflow velocity to be around 1.5 meters per second, which that's what speed is of a dog sniffing. We wanted this, the frequency of the device between uh, z uh, zero and 10 hertz. Um, uh, because the, basically the, the sensor that we use is actually not very strong. Our sensor could only measure around, around 6 hertz, so we wanted to be in the range of the sensor. And we basically have a system of bellows that moves air in and out so that when airflow moves across the sensor, it has this oscillatory pattern. And we, one thing we made sure is that there's very little dead space, so that most of the airflow that goes across, this, uh, uh, goes, um, across the sensor is also not just lost in some stationary part of the, part of the sensor. Oops. So the sensor for this competition was standardized. I think it's about $10. Um, they're called mini oxide sensors. Um, and they work by having basically a layer of tin oxide um, and what the cheese or other molecules does is basically just um, it grabs oxygen molecules and that changes the voltage reading on the sensor. And this is what you can see on the sensor in real time if you breathe on it or something like that. Originally, there's no reading. And then the sensor can change in, in basically resistance or a current. I think I'll report current in the later part of this talk. And then as you take the object away, you basically have this uh, basically a signal back to equilibrium. So currently, most machine learning, machine oxide, um, machine olfaction devices, they basically just use two um, uh, signals. They use basically the amount that it decreases here and the amount that it increases. And as you can see, because the process of diffusion is slow, these take on the scale of 10 to 20 seconds. And that's not very effective. If I wanted to figure out I want to eat something, I don't want to wait 20 seconds to sort of see this. So that's where sniffing comes in, because you can get information on a time scale uh, not of diffusion, but of basically of the order of convective motion. Um, for our contest, we basically grouped, for example, Gouda and Manchego 
uh, into different categories based on the signals that we got from this one, this one, and the associatory signal here. And um, uh, with machine learning, you can group them and basically have them, ha when you have a new cheese, you can identify if it falls near closer to the Gouda or if it falls closer to the Manchego um, uh, category. Um, and it, that method seemed to work pretty well. So these are um, some Schlieren uh, videos of a dog actually um, sniffing. Um, now one thing is, sniffing is a behavior that's really evolved in animals. Um, it happens at about eight times per second for a dog, um, and they breathe about one time per second. So it's, I mean, if you try to sniff, um, I'll show a plot, if you try to sniff at the appropriate rate for your body mass, you will probably faint or go unconscious because you're just basically not going to get any oxygen to your brain. So it's really, um, you really have to sniff at very high frequency in order for this to happen. Um, for, if you look at the scaling, which we did across different mammals, um, for elephants, we'll sniff at about 4.5 liters. Um, so this is based on the scaling uh, for the dogs. We extrapolated that to different mammals. Uh, elephant needs about 4.5 liters per sniff. Um, a dog needs about um, 30 milliliters. Uh, and a rat will need something that's about the size of an eyedropper drop. Um, so they'll need different volumes. And accordingly, they also, they also have different frequencies. So we actually we went to the Atlanta Zoo and uh, measured the frequencies of these animals sniffing and compiled it with data that was on mice and through different breeds of dogs. And across, uh, across the range of mammals, you know, they, they have basically five orders of magnitude in body mass. Their sniffing frequency decays um, uh, between two times per second, which is that of an elephant, um, which is something we could manage, to about 15 times per second, which is that of a mouse. Uh, if we were to sniff, we would fall about here. We would need to sniff about 10 times per second um, in order to be consistent with these animals. So why do bigger animals sniff slower? Um, the primary reason for that is the differing volumes of air. Um, essentially, your lungs can produce a constant uh, a force that has a constant pressure. Uh, most of the muscles in the body are composed of the same muscle fibers, and so the force per unit area is the same. Um, for the elephants, it was 10 kilopascal for um, sniffing water, smelling water. It's the same for mosquitoes, and it's the same for humans. So that lung force is applied to the uh, cross-sectional area. It depends on where you put your control volume, but if we consider our control volume to be in the trachea, that's the radius of the trachea here. And the inertial force of the air goes as the mass of the air, which is the length of the trachea times um, uh, the radius squared, um, times its acceleration, which is the length of the trachea times the frequency squared. So for you to pull this larger volume of air in the body, your frequency is going to go as 1 over the body length. In other words, the bigger you are, um, the slower you're going to sniff. Um, the fewer times per second. And again, it's because you've got a larger volume, uh, but your, uh, your radius to volume ratio uh, doesn't go up favorably. So the black points here is the frequencies that these animals sniff at, measured from experiments. Um, that theoretical uh, model that I presented a second ago, that's given by this blue line um, where we extrapolated the parameters for the tracheal radius and the lung pressure. Um, for these animal, um, from data on these animals. Um, you can see they kind of have com kind of comparable trends. We don't really have the right exponent. We have negative one third. It's really negative, um, uh, you know, one, one fifth, one sixth. And breathing is all the way down here. So uh, again, breathing also has comparable trends too because um, when you breathe, you also have to breathe larger volumes, but you only have so much lung pressure. Um, um, but it, uh, it occurs eight times slower than sniffing. So, uh, did you, uh, someone have a question? OK. Um, so why, why do animals sniff? Um, there's no theory for why animals sniff. But if you look in the cardiovascular literature, there's been a lot of interest in oscillatory flows. Um, Wormsley, um, and this is in the early um, you know, um, 1960s, 1950s, he defined this dimensionless group, which is essentially a Reynolds number, a ratio of inertia to viscous forces when you, don't ha when you have an oscillation. So instead of a velocity, what you have is a, the diameter of your tube times uh, the frequency uh, divided by your uh, kinematic viscosity of your blood. 
And interestingly enough, for blood, uh, the Wormsley number is, uh, for humans is between 2 and 14. In other words, uh, inertia effects dominate. And for animals, if you look at their sniffing Wormsley number, it's uh, comparable. It's between 1, it's between 3 and 14. Uh, maybe there's some reasons why you know, it's a totally different fluid, 1,000 times denser, but they have comparable Wormsley numbers. So what does that physically mean if you're bringing fluid in and out in a oscillatory fashion? Well, this is an experiment we've done. Um, you can do this um, probably at home. You take a humidifier. And you can bring it into a tube that's a square cross section and transparent walls. And you can sort of see, um, you can use PIV to look at basically the motion of the air. And one of the things that you see when this experiment like is this is that the motion of the air depends on the, where you are in the cross section. Oh, that's a student that did this experiment. Um, in particular, if you're near the walls, you will decay, you will delay the transition longer because you have higher viscous forces holding you in place. Um, so, this, so the Wormsley flows have, have been calculated, you know, these are uh, closed form solutions um, for basically circular channels. Um, and this is basically, if you look at what's the velocity field, uh, basically a single cross section, how fast is the fluid going as a function of position. And like I said, if you're near the wall, you'll be going slower than if you're in the center. And so I'm going to show you this movie of basically us stepping through different um, parts of the cycle. Um, but I want you to keep your eye on what happens near the wall. Because all smelling, that's true for elephants. Um, so elephants have more olfactory neuron, olfactory genes than any other animal. For elephants and dogs, all of us have the sensors near the wall. So the whole issue and the physical problem of sniffing is getting the molecules you know, in the bulk fluid, my nice cheesy tortilla molecules, all the way to the wall. And for that, I've got to give it enough time uh, for the molecules to diffuse. Because the fluid is going basically axially. Um, there's no convection motion near the wall. So basically, that is given, what I need is time. Uh, in particular, if the molecules are diffusing with a constant uh, diffusion constant d, um, and basically, the, if I'm moving at a velocity u, um, there, basically, the distance, I have a distance x away from the wall where the amount of time I have is given by uh, the size of my sensor, d divided by u. And all those molecules will have a chance of actually diffusing to my sensor. Molecules farther away from that are just not, um, not close enough to basically diffuse. So let's step through. Right now, this is, um, what this is is high Wormsley number. So we're starting at a high Wormsley number where, um, I'm sorry, I always get this messed up. This is low Wormsley, this is low Wormsley number where there's, the walls actually have a large effect. Okay, um, that's shown by the velocity field, which decays very quickly towards the wall. And um, this is basically the input and output, you know, inhale and exhale, and you can see the velocity vectors are going back and forth. But close enough to the wall, the speed is slow enough that the molecules have enough time to diffuse to the sensor. Now this is basically um, increasing the Wormsley number. So I'm increasing the inertia of the flow um, so that basically it looks like a plug. Um, and this is actually disadvantageous for sniffing because you can see the velocity near the wall is getting higher. That means my molecules will spend even less time uh, near the sensor, and I'm basically going to get even fewer and fewer collection. Now, this is the, probably the highest Wormsley numbers at all, where basically it hardly sees the wall, and it's basically just sort of going like a plug. And so that's um, what animals are experiencing all the way from mice. Um, this would be an elephant, um, a high, the highest Wormsley number of about 14, um, where the, it really is getting very, very few of the molecules. So here are a couple of different velocity profiles um, that you can uh, numerically calculate based on the closed form solution. And um, I can, all I'm going to say is that you can actually calculate the number of molecules that diffuse and hit the wall by estimating, because the velocity fields for the closed form solution are known. You can figure out what distance x away from your sensor that you have a velocity of sufficient um, low uh, speed that you actually get diffusion in the wall. And you integrate across the entire cycle, um, not just for a single part of the cycle, but for all the velocity fields across the cycle. And so you can estimate the number of molecules that, that could land. And that's given by uh, this, uh, this curve, the black curve here. And the data here is actually from our sniffing device. Um, so I'll walk you through how, how we get this data. 
um, this is the that mini oxide sensor and before I start before I put the cheese in the experiment uh, originally you have no change in current as soon as the cheese is introduced I start my sniffing and you can see there's a there's some information getting to the sensor and so what I'm interested in is not basically the ascent or the descent because those are occur at too slow a time scale what I care about if I'm an animal is how high these amplitudes are um, because that's basically what I'm going to tell if this is something I want to eat or not and that data is plotted on this side. Um, so um, basically, if you sniff at very, very high frequency, um, the issue is you're getting very, you, the amplitude basically is getting, is not very high. Um, as you saw from the high frequency data, the high Wormsley number data, the speed near the walls is very high. So there's very little time for the oxygen, the molecules that diffuse to the sensor. And I'm basically getting a, a very low signal. And there's a limit. If you sniff too fast, you actually won't be able to get signal at all. That's sort of the noise limit of your sensor. Um, so animals really want to be as high on this, I think, as possible, because what I think animals want to do is they want to get information as quickly as possible. If you sniff too slowly, on the other hand, then you're basically getting into this regime, where you're just waiting for diffusion to happen, and you're not using the capabilities of your sniffer. So this is a little kind of open debate, because I'm not sure what triggers an animal to decide if something is food or not. Um, because as I mentioned, if you sniff very, very quickly, um, you get very low signal per sniff. But if you, we, what we did is we calculated the number of particles that land over a set duration of time. Um, even though you're sniffing more quickly, you basically have more cycles. So those higher frequencies actually, you get more, the integral of all those particles that land is higher. So they actually get more particles over a set, di over a set distance. Um, 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 but basically, they have less, but each amplitude is, is lower per cycle. So it's not clear if animals are detecting it based on um, basically a single sniff, or maybe they need multiple sniffs in order to get the total uh, sum of particles attracting. Um, so, um, Rin Carde and a few other speakers are here tomorrow talking about olfaction. Um, so I thought I'd talk, this has nothing to do with elephants, but um, we've applied some similar methods to look at how moth antenna are designed. Um, and I think we'll probably see some, some of this um, tomorrow as well. But um, this is actually what, so these moths that fly around at night, they're purported to find female moths, the males at least, at 12 kilometers distance away. Um, and they do so through a, a tentacle that's inherently hierarchical. So it has this initial uh, base stem, um, which, you, which you can see visibly. And then they have these things called branches that leak out. And on those branches, they have individual hairs. So that's the physical picture I want you to take away before I show you these images. Um, this is uh, taken with a confocal microscope, where we basically added you know, slices of this moth antenna together. The olfactory. Um, um, sort of sensors are on, um, I think they're on the individual hairs. So they're sort of uh, all over here. And um, what we did was we measured the geometry of 50 different types of moths. And what we focused on was the angle of this branch with respect to the stalk. And there's a lot of parameters you could look at. Um, for example, that, this is that moth antenna um, originally. And if you calculate the surface area of all these hairs, um, what you get is, uh, well, if you add the length of all these hair, you get the antenna is effectively like a foot long, you know, um, uh, 12 centimeters long. Um, uh, and so basically having this greater surface area really helps add to the amount of particles this thing could potentially capture. Um, it's, it's hierarchical also in the sense that the diameter scales. So basically each, uh, as you go up in hierarchy, the um, width of that stalk is 10 times wider than the width of the branch, which is 10 times wider than the width of each of these hairs. And that seems to be true across different moths, similarly for the length and uh, similarly for the spacing. So there are some rules that, that are guiding sort of why these, why these are scalings are the way they are. Um, I won't really talk about that today. Um, oh, I already showed that. Um, so we did this experiment where we um, tried to mimic the Reynolds number of fluid striking the moth antenna. Uh, this is actually a small dental piece of dental material where we built a wind tunnel and we basically hit it with fluid. And um, if you basically just, 
And this was based on this measurement on moss that we found was surprising that most moths, when they stick their antenna into the flow, they don't stick it uh, horizontally, basically 90 degrees. And like if I want to capture as many air molecules as possible, you would think you would be like this, like a scarecrow. So you expose the most area, and so most of this thing would hit it. Um, but the moths tend to have their angles at 45 degrees with uh, respect to the flow. Um, and so we did this experiment where we had this humidifier sending fluid, these small drops. And these are the, with ultraviolet light, you can see what has been adhered to the antenna after about a minute. And you can see, as you expect, if I put my antenna into the flow, I only get stuff adhering to the very tip. All the juicy olfactory molecules, the cheese, the tortilla, are just flying past and nothing's adhering. Um, and at 90 degrees, I get uh, adhering. But the surprising thing is at 45 degrees, you get the most um, particles that land. And that's surprising because it has a lower surface area contact. So there must be some fluid dynamical effect that's causing more of these particles to land. This, uh, these particles are about 10, um, about 10 microns. So they're you know, orders and orders of magnitude bigger than those that of the olfaction. Um, but we think maybe some, this might have an effect of why moths are, are doing, doing this. You can do the same thing with smoke if you blow smoke past you know, a wooden dowel. Um, and 90 degrees, you basically get this kind of effect where the smoke will expand uh, due to the fact that it's slowing down when it hits this thing and has to go around it. Um, and then in the back, you have a wider wake. But for any oblique angles, you get this effect we call the lingering effect, where um, smoke basically has to tr will travel down the rod for some length before it passes. Um, and that's really enhanced. This is about, this is about 40, this is, I think, um, 45 degrees. They, they, you get a very long, a long swath. So you can imagine if you have an olfactory plume and it hits basically these rods that are at 45 or at oblique angles, you could get some benefits. Here's a schematic of that same process. And physically, what that is doing, if you have more time near your antenna or rod, it's similar to what I showed with the Wormsley number on the elephants. And that basically, if you have more, basically, if you have to delay your, um, you know, the change of trajectory, so that you're spending more time around this rod than you would normally. More time on the rod means um, the envelope that this rod is absorbing um, um, from the wind is increasing so that you have more potential particles that can land by diffusion. Um, that basic idea, so unfortunately, when we, when we have this model that we consider the diffusive effects of particles landing on this thing. And um, for particles of the size of moss, we basically don't get any, we don't get any effect. But for um, particles of the size of the um, uh, experiments of 10 microns, we do get you know, extra benefits where we basically measure numerically the amount of distance that they travel along the rod um, and the amount of t extra time they're going to be spending. All right. Now it's for the fun part of the talk. Uh, looking to decrease this volume here. So yeah, every, every couple of years, I try to do a project um, that's just for fun. Um, this one, I was giving a, we were giving a talk on defecation on this universal law of so I won this thing called the Ig Nobel Prize um, for research that makes people laugh and think. And um, we're giving this talk on defecation. And someone asked me at the end of the talk is if my theory could account for cubic feces. Um, and so I never heard about these animals before, but these live in Tasmania. Um, they are marsupials. They have pouches. Their pouches actually point backwards um, so that when they dig, they don't get dirt into their, um, you know, into their babies. But unfortunately, that also means that they poop directly on their, um, uh, uh, the, on their basically, uh, juveniles' heads. Uh, but that's the way evolution works, just good enough. So that's, this is actually the actual feces um, we got shipped from Australia. Um, we play games of chance in my lab. Um, you can see the feces does have you know, eight sides. Um, I wouldn't bet a million dollars using this pair of dice that we made with wombat feces. But um, it is surprising. Like This is a 3D scan of the feces. Um, it really does have flat edges. Um, so if you look at Australian folklore, 
Um, they have a lot of theories for why wombats have cubic feces because people walk around and they'll find cubic feces. And um, some, basically, they rely on these three ideas of how cubes are built in you know, our made world. So the, if you have a pair of dice, that was probably made by injection molding, where you send in a hot liquid, uh, which is in a liquid state, and it forms the shape of its mold because liquids fill the shape of their container, and then it solidifies um, once it cools down. Um, um, we don't think that's the case um, the, um, from the dissections I'm going to show you in a second. The other option is, um, this is, oh, this is great because we're in Italy. It's like pasta making or extrusion. If you want to make a pasta, you send soft dough through um, you know, very hard dyes. And so the Australian folklore said that wombats have square uh, anuses um, so that it would come out like a square. Uh, and we quickly showed that that was not the case. They're circular just like ours. Um, and the last method is basically the process of like, um, like um, basically just drilling or, or basically removing parts of it so that you get a cube. And neither of these work. So the wombat seems to be like a third, a third method. And cubes, indeed, are pretty rare. So this is, um, for years, people have used different animal poop sizes and shapes to identify different animals. In general, animals will defecate about 1 one hundredth their body mass. Um, uh, for me, that's like 1.5 pounds uh, per day. Um, and that's also true, true for the wombat. But what's special about the wombat is the dryness of the feces. So biologists often ask me, why in the world would cubic feces evolve um, my current theory is this, is that um, the wombats generally do not like each other. They spend time mostly underground, and they only contact each other through territorial markings, which they leave on the outskirts of their territory. Um, and they like to make these markings laid on the tallest point that they can climb with their cubic squat bodies, which for them is a rock or a stump or a log. So every time you find their poop, it will be basically on these, this is a tall point for a wombat, on these outcroppings here. And I think if over evolutionary time, as they were doing this more and more, if the cube, if the feces grew more and more square, it wouldn't roll down the rocks and it would act like it's a better marker. Um, because they are the only animals, well, kangaroos would be a close second that have you know, edges on their poop. Um, and you can see it does do a pretty good job of staying on top of that rock. Not so much for these, um, but that's the theory that I have right now. So this is the actual intestine that was shipped to us from Australia. Um, it costs about $1,000 to ship this thing to the United States. Um, it's liquid in the stomach, and in the end it becomes solid. Um, in the beginning, it's really shapeless. It has no you know, length, width, or height. You can see it's, it's very wide. But as it gets to end, in the end, it gets more and more um, similar length, width, and height properties. This is a pretty gross image right before a coffee hour. <laughs> um, but I thought this is pretty telling. So, that's the, so we didn't actually harm any wombats in the study. They're naturally hit by cars. And we have a collaborator who he studies the wombat genetics, so he needs to squeeze a fresh wombat heart into a jar to collect their blood to get the genes. But before he does that, he cuts it open and he sends us the intestines. So that's the actual poor wombat, you know, uh, and that's the intestines. It eats grass, and it's, the wombat is very drought tolerant. So you can see the feces, it's, I mean, it's, it's somewhat dry, but it gets really, really dry as it gets to the end. So this intestine is about five meters long. Um, uh, that long length helps accommodate um, based the amount of dryness it's going to get. So our feces, for your information, is about 70% water. A wombat's feces is about 30%, so it's about twice as dry. And that's what's normal for them. And you can see originally, this is probably similar to what you see for a horse uh, or a donkey. But then, you know, after it gets 70% level of dryness, here it's getting to 30% level of dryness. You can see the characteristic edges and square you know, cross sections. You know, that's really just what came out. That's as fresh as it gets. And that's associated also with a change in color. So I was at a geology conference trying to understand why, how they do this. Oh, Nick Grafish was there. We were at the, and I was talking to these geologists. And then they were telling me about this place. Um, there's places like this all over the world. One of them is Giant Causeway, Ireland, where you have natural geometric structures forming in rocks due to the particular cooling conditions of that rock. Um, 
this is a, here you get hexagons, and this is a cross section of those rocks as you go all the way down. You know, five meters down, you get continual, you know, these shapes forming naturally in these conditions. And uh, so this was studied um, for a long time by geologists, and recently there was a paper by Mahadevan in PNAS about repeating these same structures, not in rock, but in cornstarch. So this is actually cornstarch with, uh, this is a pretty, it's a nice experiment where they have water, bath, cornstarch, and they have a heat lamp that heats the cornstarch at different rates. Um, and what they find is that the geologists have found that there's a certain Peclet number, um, a dimensionless group that relates the, uh, the convection force, the force of um, heat leaving the rock to the diffusion of heat across the rock. And these structures are formed only when the Peclet number is um, a small but constant quantity of at least, Mahadevan found it was 0.15 for cornstarch, 0.3 for lava, uh, at least uh, for the Great Causeway in Ireland. Um, and basically, the Peclet number is the ratio of the, the velocity of the fluid leaving, here I'm going to consider, this is a model of that wombat intestine, the velocity of the water leaving the inside of the feces going to the outside um, times the crack, uh, the length between uh, feces, and divided by the diffusion of water that goes laterally. So if you actually measure the wombat intestine is 500 centimeters long, they keep their feces for 100 hours, which is you know, twice as long as us, it's about five days. Um, and so the velocity of the, of, the, of the scats are about five to 10 centimeters per hour. So you can estimate how quickly they lose, you know, go from 100% you know, saturation to 30% of the end. Um, and you can get a water velocity of about a millimeter per day. That's basically the speed of water leaving the feces. And if you use the Peckley number um, for these different, you know, um, cornstarch and lava you know, geometric structures, you find a crack length and you use the same diffusion constant, you get a crack length of about two centimeters, which is half of what's observed in nature. So what I propose is that the wombats, because of their particular drying rates and the width of their intestine, they can control that the spacing, the length of their poop pieces are um, comparable to their intestinal width, um, which are two independent quantities. So I, we still do not have a good explanation for forms the corners. That's what sets the basic size. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, this is not to heating. This is just to where you would put the cracks. The number of cracks you would get is L over W. Oh, OK. Which is going to give you a Q. So but that's what you post. But that, that argument doesn't, is not based on heat. It's basically the number of cracks you would apply to just. So in, the, in your case, the yeah. comparable situation is that if you have uh, drying uh, yeah. going through, and uh, it's proceeding more or less uniformly across the, the, the system, then you're going to find cracks yeah, and they seem to be somewhat, you know, it's pretty quite consistent. You know, you don't have any long, any long ones. And, um, um, and in fact, I mean, the intestines are not this long inside the body. There's not enough space. But there are segments that are maybe five widths long, which is maybe enough to do like a finite beam. I'll have to, uh, we'll have to talk about feces during the coffee break. <laughs> um, so we, that gives us, it looks like there are several reasons why they would be of constant length. We still do not know why the corners form. So this is a measurement of the volume in each of these corners. And you can see uh, the, the more volume is in these corners, the sort of rounder it is. And they really get quite uh, you know, square, really very high curvature at the very end. Um, so my graduate student is actually um, a clown balloon artist. He likes to make clown balloons uh, for fun. And so we decided to use that technique to measure um, the basically, what we, what I, I had this hunch that there was some elastic anisotropy or elastic inhomogeneity. And that's because when we hung the intestines vertically, we saw that all the corners of the poops were aligned. That means that inside the intestine, inside the Womit's body, is some kind of coordinate system that tells you where this corner is going to form and it's not going to be arbitrary. And in fact, when we blew up a balloon inside the intestine, these are surgical markers. Um, you can find that basically 
the stiffness changes. Uh, for a pig, it's more or less uniform, maybe plus or minus 20 10 or 20 percent. But for wombat, there's basically a factor of um, four in the elastic modulus um, as you go around. I was disappointed to find there are only basically two regions, so that which means that we are not going to get four corners out of this thing. Um, but uh, we went with that. So we, we basically try to do these experiments with pantyhose and basically increasing the sniffness of certain regions of pantyhose um, and squishing it, which is to emulate the effect of drying. Um, uh, we get structures. This is not cubic by any means, but you can see if you have a higher stiffness area, that will cause it to be flatter in that zone. As opposed to if you have no stiffness changes at all, as you expect, you get a uniform cross section. This is a crude numerical model. Um, where we have particles that are pushing out with a radio, constant radial force, and we have this. There's no bending in this in this in this membrane, but basically uh, resistance of stretching. Um, and at least in the beginning, you can see, you know, if, if you have uniform stiffness, you get a circular poop. But if you don't have uniform stiffness, you can get um, different kinds of shapes. Um, so. Um, with that, uh, thanks for being such a great audience. Um, some of the work here and uh, my previous work so was published in this book. So I wrote this book called How to Walk on Water and Climb Up Walls by Princeton University Press. And I went on this international book tour last year. Um, the book is on uh, Amazon, on Audible, read by seven hours by an Italian-American actor. Um, it's been translated Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. Um, Today's uh, ICTP, I'll be at Fermilab, then at the Ignobles, and Dartmouth, uh, American College of Rheumatology, Caltech, Waterloo, North Carolina Academy of Sciences, Lenore Rhine, and then back in Toulouse um, for the next year to talk about my book and about other things. Um, but thanks for being such a great audience. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, the stomach is mostly. But uh, when you talk about when you think about surface tension, because the surface area is changing, the surface tension uh, <coughs> could be a relevant parameter. And surface tension uh, and surface energy are the same for a liquid, but not the same for a solid. And that causes, you know, that, that can cause uh, changes in how you consider the problem. I don't know how, I couldn't think far ahead what way it would be relevant. But basically, as it goes from a liquid state, what's optimal was a sphere, and maybe there could be something different. Yeah, there is a paper on square drops. Uh, they put you know, arrays of hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces and then show that. Uh, I don't think they changed the viscosity, but they, could, they showed they could make drops, force drops to be square. Um, the poop is actually it's, it's liquid, but it's still composed of very small grass fibers. Um, um, and I think maybe also the drying process helps arrange these fibers fibers as well. But um, yeah, this idea of surface area, yeah, cubes is, doesn't seem like it's good for minimizing surface area. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a good, maybe it would be interesting to try to measure the surface area of the different, uh, different materials, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you showed before the expansion of the elephant. Yeah. Um, which the, the trunk assume a posture, a different posture depending on the weight of the item they have to lift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to know whether uh, the elephant uh, assumed this posture already the first time just to watch it, the item, or if they have to uh, assess, to test the weight, and then they learn how to to assume this uh, vertic vertical posture. So they, at the first uh, uh, glance, they mm -hmm. decide how to lift uh, the item, or just they try the first time I think the first time we gave them the item, that's definitely the case, that they, um, they spend a lot, they basically do different attempts. Um, but um, uh, let me see if I can get to that video. Oh, here it is. Uh, 
Yeah, we, that's a good question. We, we did expect weights kind of in order, of increasing order. Um, so it is possible maybe they kind of learned, learned to do that. They, I mean, this is, 90, this is 45 pounds, and uh, this is um, you know, 20, 20 kilograms, which is just the bar itself. Um, so it's possible maybe they see, see that weight in kind of in preparation. Um, so in nature, they, would, they use this behavior to up, uh, uproot trees. So they'll pick up a tree and eat it. They'll literally pull it up out of the ground. I think they can maybe, based on the side of the tree, they can get an initial estimate guess of basically how many wraps they're going to need uh, to, pick it, to pick it up. Um, because the visual properties of the object are probably processed. But at least in, in primates, it, it happens, mm -hmm. in, in human also. And there are also neurons uh, involved in this. Uh, in this task, in the sense that there are neurons responding. In the motor cortex, there are neurons uh, already responding to the visual property of the, of the Oh, and tell us basically how to prepare to lift this thing. Yeah, and, and, and so uh, it's possible that, uh, like it happens also in monkey, that they imagine the way of the, of the item they have to lift at the first time. Mm. Then may adjust later, depending on the experience. You can try to cheat them. Yeah, I think we had cover cover it up, cover the weights maybe. No, just uh, uh, use a polystyrol. The oh, oh yeah, styrofoam. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it's it's a. Uh, oh, and bad, see, oh yeah, they might break the, <laughs> they might just lift the whole <laughs> lift the whole thing. And, um, but they've probably done that trick with humans. And we do that all, when we lift a box and, yeah. and see if we can get them off balance. I think that would be, that would be, that would be interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's also, they're just pushing against gravity too. Uh, like for uplifting trees, there's different kind of like resistance and things like that. Like somehow they can accommodate and adapt, adapt to these things. Um, but I think what, what they want to avoid is shear stress. They want to avoid basically scratching their trunk. So they really want to maintain a tight grip. So, um, and we, uh, I don't think I showed it here, but we have, we measured their, the acceleration. They, they tend to pull with constant acceleration. So I think maybe in the beginning, uh, they see if it's not working, then they can try to change, change their grip. Um, but they basically pull with constant, constant force, it seems. Yeah. Um, uh, I think you were first, Jerome. Um, so, the actual, so we actually study the brand. So I kind of use that as just an example. In reality, the antennas, they're actually, there's a, I don't think people actually measured it. What we did measure was the angle of the branch to the stalk. Um, and so when fluid, I, it, it was just, when I demonstrated, I just like to show the entire thing. But we need to be massing fluids hitting uh, the stalk and it basically go, run across it. And basically, what matters uh, is the angle of this branch relative to the stalk. Um, um, and that seems to be, when we look at uh, these moths of different uh, datas, um, this peaked at 45 degrees, um, uh, that angle. Um, uh, the moths, they actually, and other animals, they tend to move there. And they can actually move. They have mobile bases, so they can move these things around. And it's not clear. I would love them to always keep it at 45 degrees to verify my model, but that's not, I don't think that's the case. There are probably other things going on, uh, different kinds of turbulence and things like that. Um, but at least the fixed, they cannot change the branch angle. And for some reason, there's a predominance of them liking 45 degrees for the, at least the branch. We, we studied a model species which has the, uh, uh, the sensitive, the, the okay. tiny ones facing the flow for some surprising reasons. Uh, okay. Yeah, even so, these particles are 10 microns. Um, they basically will strike by impaction. There's almost no, diff no diffusion um, associated with their motion. Smoke 
is still too big um, compared to real chemicals. Um, and so our model predicts basically you know, that, you, that if moths were trying to pick up particles, they should be 45. But the model also predicts if moths are trying to pick up objects that diffuse, um, that it's not nowhere close. So we basically, um, what we really need to do is probably do an experiment where we you know, do electrophysiology on a moth and see if we can move the things around. But um, that's beyond, beyond, that's probably with collaborators. Yeah. Um, oh, I think we'll get this one first. Oh yeah, the baby elephants. So they, when they're born, it takes them about a year or two to learn to pick up anything. I mean, it's really similar to a human baby is born, can't talk, and you can sort of make sounds, but you can't do deliberate things. Certainly you can't do, I mean, picking up small tortilla chips and picking up 10 objects at once, that requires like a lot of practice. Um, so they, I think, they drink milk for the first year or two. They're really nursing. And as they learn to practice, they can sort of pick up more things. The trunks also in the very beginning are totally covered in hair. They're very, very fuzzy. So I think that helps them you know, figure out where they're touching things. Eventually, most of those hair fall off, and only a few remain. Um, and in terms of suction, um, the suction is predominantly because the elephant's mouth is like three meters off the ground, and it can't get to the water. So it basically has to use the trunk to pull it to the water. And um, the babies, because they're drinking milk, I think they can sort of you know, drink the milk, or they can just go on the, I think when a baby elephant goes to drink, what we see is they do this method of put their whole head in the water. <laughs> so I think that works if you're small, but it becomes undignified if you're like an adult elephant, so they don't do that anymore. Um, but that's how they get up around it, because I think it takes coordination. They've got two sphincters in the trunk um, to basically, because you bring water so I did not try this at home, but if you try to bring milk into your nose so you can drink it into your mouth, you have to be very careful that it doesn't get into your lungs because that can cause pneumonia. So they have two sphincters, and they measure very carefully when to, they fill their trunk with about six liters of fluid. Um, uh, and they basically have a little stopping point in between. So um, I do want to show that. I didn't mention that, so I do kind of want to mention that. But they have a stopping point in between, which I think they're kind of like uh, as a little safety factor. Um, uh, here. Basically, when it gets to halfway full, they stop. I know it's possible, you know, this is coming very fast. It's three liters per second. So, and that, you know, um, in that one second, it's got three liters of volume in the trunk. It stops and then it sucks again. Um, at the same speed, they don't really have a slow suction, um, but I think the coordination to prevent you from drinking the water and getting into your lungs all takes somehow practice. And I think they probably, I'm guessing a baby elephant will put little bits at a time before they fill the entire thing. Um, um, I think you, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, well, you just answered it. I was wondering about what stops things from getting into their lungs, particularly like flour or something that you really wouldn't want to get in there. Yeah. Well, they do make mistakes. Um, uh, like those cubes we saw when they sucked, uh, they're such in a rush to eat those cubes. Sometimes they will make a mistake and suck a cube all the way into the middle of their trunk. And you'll see them basically stop. And they'll turn their trunk into a knot and kind of try to push it, push it down and then try to sneeze it down. Um, they also make errors in judgment. Um, they're gen so they eat only vegetables. But when it rains, frogs will come out. And they're, as they're picking up food to eat, they'll pick up a frog and throw it in their mouth, and they just spit it out in disgust. Um, so I think there are times they can't, they can't actually judge what it is. They're really working, I would say almost they're working blind when they're kind of picking up, picking up objects. Um, yes, just one more comment. Of the maybe 150 thousand so species of moths, most of them really have a very thin filiform antenna, not branch. And, and, and as we mentioned, I mean, so that, I mean, again, maybe the 45 degree angle works very well for them. Oh yeah, we had to work really hard to find the, f the 50 moths with branch antenna. Yeah, most of them get along well with having the non-plumose, the, the males, the non-plumose. I don't, maybe, do those still mate? They still mate. I, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, maybe they're not working as hard. Oh really? It's, 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 it's
It's a little enigmatic, I guess, why they have diverged the way they have. Oh. Yeah, maybe it's maybe it's somewhat of a display or something like that. That's that's pretty interesting. The number of scintilla actually is, is can be they're very very small moths, and they may only have a thousand scintilla uh -huh. on the antenna, whereas some of these other ones you're you're talking tens of thousands. So it's it's a huge range to think about. Oh, the the difference in numbers of scintilla yeah. between the smooth and the plumose. Yeah, small moth, big moth. Oh, I see. Coffee break. Thank Brownie you. time. Thank you.